or in exile had begun in Alma-Ata, Kazakhstan, 22 days before the Ilyich moored at Istanbul. At the end of the voyage, right at the gates of Istanbul, he received one final communication from Stalin's Central Committee, an envelope containing $1,500. World War I had shattered Europe, bringing down most of the continent's empires and replacing them with nation states. With Trotsky's arrival, two revolutions crossed paths at the gates of Istanbul. Trotsky had helped to destroy Tsarist Russia. Ataturk had formed a new republic from the rubble of the Ottoman Empire. It had taken a costly four-year war of independence to achieve and marked not only popular rejection of a map imposed by foreign powers, but also a determination to change into a modern, westernized society. When Trotsky arrived in Istanbul, the Republic was only six years old. No longer the sick man of Europe, Turkey was young and healthy. Hats and suits ousted the fez and the kaftan. Latin characters replaced the Arabic alphabet. Women who had been slaves in harems now had the right to vote. The films of the time told the importance of the day and the dynamism of the country. At 4 p.m., Trotsky entered the arrival hall of the port of Istanbul. Along with the Turkish security officials to greet him was Suzlov, the Soviet consul. It was more like the arrival of a foreign dignitary than a common exile. Sayın Trotsky, Türk topraklarına hoş geldiniz. Благодарю. Я внимательно слежу за событиями в Турции. Несмотря на ваше гостеприимство, я вряд ли задержусь здесь надолго. Я вас не утомлю. Мой паспорт у Седова. Ne kadar kalacağınız size bağlı. İstediğiniz bir zamanda istediğiniz yere gidebilirsiniz. Ama burada kaldığınız süre içinde hiç kuşkunuz olmasın. Rahat etmeniz için elimizden geleni yapacağız. Budu priznatelen, если это письмо будет незамедлительно вручено уважаемому главе государства. Evet, hiç kuşkunuz olmasın. Bunu kendisine ileteceğiz. On the instructions of Turkish Interior Minister Shukru Kaya to the governor of Istanbul, security was tight. There were no journalists. Sayın Trotsky, size İstanbul'daki Sovyet Sosyalist Cumhuriyetleri Başkonsolosu Sayın Suslov'u takdim etmek istiyorum. Добро пожаловать, Лев Давыдович. В целях вашей безопасности мы хотели бы разместить вас на некоторое время в Генконсульстве. Надеюсь, что только в качестве гостя. While the paperwork was being completed and pleasantries exchanged, young Sidov stood guard over 12 chests, everything that Trotsky owned. They contained no money or jewelry, only the books and documents the exile would use to direct the opposition against Stalin. Officials told Trotsky on his arrival that they had not been told he was being exiled, only that he was arriving for health reasons. Ataturk knew he had to be careful. 
Any mishap that might befall Trotsky in Turkey could have major international implications. He instructed Muhittin Ustundag, the governor of Istanbul, to reply to Trotsky's letter. Our police have taken all the necessary security measures regarding your safety. It would be advisable for you to inform the officers in charge of your security of any suspicious movement or activity you may perceive. But implementing that security was another question. Trotsky would first reside at the Soviet consulate, which was Soviet territory, and where the Turks could not protect him. But no one believed Stalin would be foolish enough to make an attempt on his rival's life inside the compound. The Turkish authorities could only help once Trotsky stepped outside the consulate, which meant he had to inform the police beforehand of his every move. The authorities were particularly uneasy with the white Russian population of Istanbul, victims of Trotsky's Red Army. Police headquarters were flooded with informants' reports of hitmen flocking to Istanbul, ready to empty their guns on Trotsky when the moment came. The list of suspects grew by the hour. But Trotsky was not Turkey's only security problem. There was considerable opposition to Ataturk's reforms. Anti-Western riots throughout the country, some of them foreign-inspired, were an almost daily occurrence. With Trotsky's arrival, communist sympathizers joined demonstrations, posters mushroomed everywhere, calling for a people's uprising. Ataturk was confident, however, and did not see the communist movement as a threat to Turkey or its way of life. Trotsky's first home in Istanbul still stands today as the Russian consulate. During the first days of Trotsky's stay, the consulate staff treated him cordially and were diplomatically correct. Their personal belongings were never searched, no questions were asked, and they were free in their movements. Trotsky chose to remain mostly indoors while his wife and son stepped into the lively streets of the city to run their errands. The consulate was near Beoglu. At the turn of the century, Pera, as it was then known, with its diplomatic missions, theaters, hotels, casinos, cafes, music halls, foreigners, had been the symbol of Western civilization for the Ottoman Empire. Dinner at the Tokatlian Hotel would be followed by drinks and a game of billiards at the Luxembourg and a late stop at the Concordie to dance what was left of the night away. In one corner were women who avoided gazing eyes with extremely polite but ignoring eyes. On the other hand, there were men who tried equally hard to steal the women's hearts and draw their attention. A major contribution to the nightlife came from Trotsky's sworn enemies. The bankrupt generals and aristocrats of Tsarist Russia had brought with them a style of entertainment the city had never known before.
They performed in cabarets and ran restaurants, introducing exotic Russian fare, such as chicken Kiev, lamb karski, and beef stroganoff, which were to become staples on Turkish menus. Proud generals who once guarded the borders of the Russian Empire now stood guard for small tips at nightclub toilets, and pale-skinned countesses struggled to eke out an existence as prostitutes. Mercifully for the Turkish police, Trotsky's days at the Soviet consulate were numbered. Less than a month after he first walked through its gates, all pretense of courtesy disappeared. Trotsky decided to leave, and the doors of the consulate closed behind him. The glamorous Tokatlian Hotel stood just a few hundred yards from the consulate. Trotsky and his family made a discreet entrance at midnight through the service door. They took over rooms 67, 68, and 70. In the dying days of the Ottoman Empire, guests would have consisted of French, Italian, British officers, and fallen Russian aristocrats who had to sell their jewelry to afford the Tokatlian. In the early days of the Republic, well-off Turks from out of town and visiting foreign businessmen made up most of the clientele. The businessmen spent much of their time lounging around the lobby, the restaurant and bar. Their number was to increase considerably after Trotsky arrived. The hotel was full of Turkish, Soviet, German and British agents, keeping an eye on the illustrious new guest. Trotsky's followers from all over Europe came to visit him in his new quarters. One particularly welcome guest was Maurice Paz and his wife, Madeleine, who came from Paris bearing a gift of 20,000 francs. Trotsky had very little money. He was waiting for $10,000 in royalties for his books that never seemed to arrive from the United States. <laughs> 